I haven't said this on my channel before, but I actually applied for a PhD six different times. So of those six different times, there were two occasions in which I was just completely rejected. They decided I should not be there. <laughs> there are two occasions where I received an offer to do the PhD, great, but there was no funding attached to it. And finally, there were two occasions where I received an offer to study for the PhD and then an offer for full funding. So that essentially means that my tuition fees would be covered as well as my living costs. And one of those was to study at Cambridge, which is why I'm here today. This mixed bag of outcomes, this rejection failures, half failures um, essentially do mean that I have a lot of knowledge as to you know how to secure funding, how to not secure funding, what a strong application looks like and that's what this video is about today. How can you prepare yourself so that your PhD application is as strong as it can be in order to enable you to receive funding. Now whilst this video is specific to the UK higher education institutions, um, it is still open to everyone. It doesn't matter what your background is, what it is you'd like to study. That being said, I will pay close attention to the arts, humanities and social sciences because these are notoriously difficult to get funding for. There is so much more explicitly advertised funding available for those wanting to do STEM projects. And in the arts, humanities and social sciences, it's just so unclear, so confusing. Um, there are slightly different routes to doing PhDs in those fields and as an education student, so as a social science student, I really struggled with this. So that's what I'm going to focus on a bit more today but this video will still be helpful regardless of what field you're looking to apply to. In terms of the structure of this video, we will look at different funding sources but there will be a key focus on UKRI funding um, which is one of the kind of biggest funding bodies for UK higher education institutions and again one of the most confusing. So we'll start with um, some kind of key places you can look for funded opportunities and then we'll talk about UKRI, who they are, what they do and how to make a strong application in the hope that your PhD can be funded by a research council. So the first means by which you can get funding is to apply directly for a studentship. So this is again very common in the STEM subjects and the science subjects but they are still available to art subjects, social sciences and humanities. Now a studentship is a project that has already been slightly moulded um, and that will be moulded by a professor or a PI who wants some data collected, who wants a research project done but doesn't necessarily have the capacity to do it themselves or they're quite high um, in their level of expertise and the project they've proposed is at a lower level, more a PhD level. So they say we want this project done, we want these questions answered, we want this explored and we just need someone to do it, we've got the money, we've got the support, we've got the place in our lab or in our research centre, we just need to interview people to take that studentship on. So it's a bit more like a job in that the role is very much predefined, you apply for it directly and I guess there are pros and cons to that. The pros of course being that a lot of decisions have been made, there isn't pressure on you to come up with this new and exciting project, it's just about suitability. If you see a project and you really like the look of it, you can apply for that and take that on and yeah, I guess rest assured that big, big key decisions have been made, it's just up to you to really shape what that research project looks like and you know, kind of fix the nooks and crannies of it. In addition to that, because it probably feeds into a bigger project for that professor or that PI, you're part of a nice research centre or research network um, and in that way you probably will feel, you know, very supported, like you are part of a team. You can, I guess, more easily see where your data is going or where your findings um, are going and what ideas they feed into, so that can be really reassuring. Another obvious pro is you don't need to search for funding. <laughs> that is kind of part and parcel of the application. Um, the funding's already guaranteed, they are just trying to find the right person to take the place. In addition to that, they do start at any point of the year. So some people really like the idea of that, um, you know, perhaps doing a PhD starting in January or starting in March. I did apply for a studentship um, and that was one of the cases in which I was rejected. My feedback was very much like, oh, Erin should do a PhD, but you know, we're not too sure if she is completely suitable for this one in particular. She has the enthusiasm, she really cares about the field, um, but she maybe just wasn't as strong as other applicants. And with that studentship, I would have been expected to start basically as soon as possible. To move on to the cons, I guess a thing about those studentships 
are there is limited flexibility if you are doing a PhD because you have a passion project because you have an area of focus then a studentship probably isn't the way for you unless magically there is one that just really meets your kind of you know ideal expectations and reflects the project you'd really like to do. In a similar vein although you have say your research centre and your more immediate network Unfortunately, you may not get the feeling of being part of a bigger cohort in the way you would if you directly joined, let's say, the Department for Engineering um, in autumn term or if you started the department if you started at the Department for English with everyone else at the same time. There isn't necessarily the same kind of cohort feel or sense that we're doing this all together. The other place you can look for funding is just the different university web pages. Um, so universities will have specific pots of funding that are separate to studentships, that are separate to UKRI funding. Um, perhaps they've come from alumni, perhaps they've come from partnerships with a corporate partner, but they will be detailed on the website and they will say, you know, here is who is eligible, here is how you apply. And yeah, they're good, but difficult to find. So I would do your research, see what is available to you and see if there's anything that you're eligible for. And just to look at an example, if I go on the University of Cambridge and I look at their postgraduate funding search, I can see that there are a range of options. So you can refine your search uh, to say that you are a prospective applicant, you want to study full time, you want to do a PhD. And if you scroll down, you will see all the different sources of funding that are available. I'd really welcome or I'd really encourage you doing this. You can see there are some that are specific to particular labs, particular um, research bodies. And you can see some are specific to colleges, which is a unique thing about the Oxford system. If we click on this one here, so Professor C.H. Lee and M. Perrett's Studentship in Applied Medical Biotechnology, you can scroll down and you can see that there is some key eligibility criteria. So essentially to be eligible, you must be female and accepted as a postgraduate student. So they are saying you're only eligible once you apply as a student. Um, and if you meet particular conditions, you must be in a particular department and you must be a member of this specific college. Of course, you can also tell by the title that this is in Applied Medical Biotechnology. So the pros of this are essentially, if you do meet that particular criteria, you have a safety net, you have a second potential source of funding. So as well as perhaps applying for the main routes of funding, um, this is another kind of pot that you may be able to access. In addition to that, again, it may come with some networking benefits. If it is a funding source that has been donated by um, some alumni, they may have an idea as to how they want this student to develop, what part of networks they want them to be a part of. They might have expectations that you do a particular amount of work experience. So they may come with those kind of small perks. That being said, these pots of funding are extremely limited and difficult to find. Just because they're there and just because you meet their eligibility criteria does not by any means mean you're the only person applying for them. So for that reason, I would say look out for them. Um, definitely give them a shot, but don't expect them to be your only source of funding or your only potential source of funding. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the meat and bones of this, which is thinking about UKRI funding. So UKRI, essentially UK Research and Innovation, is this huge, huge body um, that funds a whole load of research, both at PhD level, but also even higher than that. Under them, if you think of UKRI as a big umbrella, you have the smaller research councils, which are dependent on the field of study. So you have AHRC, which is Arts Humanities Research Council, you have ESRC, Economic Social Research Council, who I have funding from, as well as a range from engineering to medicine and medical research. So to reassure you, there are enough research councils to cover absolutely every subject. They are that broad because they want to ensure that, you know, any project within the UK might fit under some of them. And these research councils collaborate with institutions, so universities, to create what we call DTPs or maybe DTCs, which are doctoral training partnerships. And when you apply for your PhD, if the institution you are applying to, as well as the department, have a DTP, you're automatically considered for funding from the DTP. So for example, I applied to the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge, who have a DTP, the Doctoral Partnership, 
um, doctoral training partnership, sorry, with the ESRC, the Economic Social Research Council. And when I applied, what happened was they saw my application and internally within the faculty, they decided if I should be put forward and considered for ESRC training. But that decision is made very much internally within the department that you are applying for. When you apply for UKRI funding, um, through this method, what you normally do is you write your research proposal, you write your personal statement, you write your PhD application, and then that is what is considered. So different to a studentship where you are saying, oh, I see this project, it looks interesting, I want to be the PhD student who runs it, you are saying, hey, I thought of this myself, I've got, I've got this all covered, I can tell you what I want to do in three years and what the outcomes will be, that's your application. And I have a video on that where I go into much more detail, so do feel free to watch that to get that step-by-step -step guide as to how to apply for a PhD. So let's say you are in a position where you want to apply for a PhD, you have your own project idea, you just need a university to accept you and for that university through their DTP to offer you funding. Here are some top tips as to how to go about that and how to be as successful as possible. The first thing I would say in terms of top tips is if you are in a position to control it, so you are still studying for an undergraduate degree or studying for a master's degree, I would do as well as you can academically as possible. Um, so when I first applied for a PhD, I was a master's student at Oxford. Um, I received an offer, but I did not receive funding. And when asking for feedback, I was told, well, you didn't have your master's grade yet. We didn't really know if you're academically capable of doing a PhD. They clearly did not like my BA grade enough. They didn't want to take a risk, so they didn't offer me funding. They wanted to give their funding to those who looked more academically competitive. That being said, if you are like, oh my gosh, I've already done my undergraduate, I've already done my master's, and you know, I maybe don't feel so confident with my grades, that is okay. There are other ways in which you can demonstrate academic merit. And also remember that, particularly in some fields, work experience is also really, really important. So I applied to my PhD having worked in the field of education and higher education in particular and that really supported my application because it meant I was an expert. Perhaps I was an expert in a more practical way but I had years of experience understanding and kind of yeah dissecting that field. In addition to that I did write an academic journal with some of the findings from my master's. Um, I did that during Covid so <laughs> the time where everyone thought they had more time and being honest, I do think that is probably the only reason I'm funded. <laughs> um, it is by no means, you know, something you have to do before you apply for a PhD. Um, it's not necessarily something everyone has at all. But if it is something you have because you've been, you know, working in the field for a long time or you have had time since doing previous studies to kind of write stuff up, that does look really good. I guess to reassure you, there are many, many ways in which you can demonstrate academic merit, but if you are in a position where you still have some control, either over, you know, your current grades or the grades you're working towards, or, um, yeah, your work experience, do really, really try to polish that academic CV so you look like an attractive academic hard-working individual. And the thing about the research paper, um, I don't think it's the fact that my research paper is any good <laughs> at all. I think it is more the case that it showed I was a proactive student who could get that work done. So they didn't have to train me or push me to be somebody who contributes to research. They were like, cool, she's got that. That makes our life a tiny bit easier. The next thing, and this may be obvious, is make sure you're doing something that has not been done before. So nobody wants to give away a place at their department or give away funding to somebody who's just going to replicate a project. But the whole point of a PhD is to contribute something new to the field, to fill a gap in the literature is something people often say. And that doesn't have to be a completely new wacky invention, but it's you saying, hey, no one's done this, I'm going to do it. I'm the right person and this is the right time for me to fill this gap in the literature and I'm going to do something that hasn't been done before. And if you're in a place where you're thinking, I don't know if this has been done before, one, make sure you're researching thoroughly. To write your application, you will do quite a lot of research and reviewing of the literature. If you do that well, you will definitely see if someone has done this already. And if you're like, hmm, 
people have kind of done it but I'm not too sure. Have a think, spend some time reflecting. Is there something unique about your methodology? Is there something unique about the context in which you're doing this? Make sure that you are really demonstrating your, in your application that this is something new, that this offers something new and different. The next thing I would really recommend is looking at previous successful applications. And this requires reaching out on your part. So it's not something that, you know, the department that you're applying to just gives out to people, but it is something that you can, you know, you can look on LinkedIn, who is funded by the research body that you're interested in and is at your institution. This is something I did when I was applying to Cambridge. Again, one of the few times I was successful, there was somebody there who I knew because we did an undergraduate at a similar time, but we weren't necessarily close friends. I sent them a message and I said, hey, I can see that you have this particular source of funding, that you are at this department. Would it be possible for me to ask you some questions about how you received that? How did you go about writing your application? And this person really, really kindly <laughs> shared their application. And in looking at a successful application, I could see how intentional they were about getting this research funding. And they were intentional through their normal application, sorry. So it wasn't just they did their application and then they hoped funding would come along. They very much streamlined their research proposal and their personal statement to demonstrate they had this funding in mind. And that included um, really tying up the impact, the key themes, the suitability of this project to the needs and the wants of say the research council, the department, their supervisor, so that when you read it, it just all makes sense. You look at it and you think, okay, I get why they're applying for this funding. I completely see the suitability and I just see everything adding up and that's what you want to do. And sometimes the only way you can really see and make sense of that is by looking at someone's successful application. Another important thing to do is contact your potential supervisor. Now, different department websites say different things about whether you're expected to or whether you're not expected to, but I would always just give it a shot. Informally reach out. Please, please, please do not write the same thing to everyone. Reach out and demonstrate that this person really is the right person to supervise you. So saying, dear doctor or professor, whoever, um, I am a potential PhD student looking to, you know, run a project focusing on give your little elevator pitch. I thought you'd be really suitable as a potential supervisor considering your expertise in X, Y, and Z. Would you be happy to meet for a quick chat? Would you be happy to, you know, read a draft proposal? Would you be happy to give feedback, do this, do that, or whatever? Now, one thing I will say is being in touch with a potential supervisor, it does in no way guarantee you a place on the course, nor does it guarantee you funding. And a good research supervisor would make that clear to you in your conversations. That being said, I think it's still extremely helpful because again, it just means things link up very well. If you don't contact a supervisor, um, if you don't research who is at the department, then the project you put forward may be rejected on the basis of, you know, suitability. It's not the case that it's a bad project, it's just that there isn't anyone there who is appropriate to supervise it or oversee it. So being in touch with a supervisor just better shapes your project. It again makes it seem as if this is all very intentional, this all makes sense. There is a real, you know, relevant connection between your project and your supervisor's expertise, whether that connection is on the basis of methodology, on content, on previous kind of experience and previous work. Again, whilst being in contact with a supervisor doesn't mean you're guaranteed a place or guaranteed funding, do listen to their feedback. Um, you're way more likely to be rejected if you have spent loads of time working with a supervisor and they have said, hey, I'd recommend you change this or I recommend you think about this more. If you then go to your interview and you're asked about that thing you were told to think about and you haven't thought about it, that supervisor has every right to be like, no, I don't think I want to work with this person because they are not receptive to feedback. They don't necessarily take the time to think through things that I have actually guided them towards. So get in contact with a supervisor manage that relationship well and in that relationship building demonstrate that you're receptive to feedback demonstrate that you can get the work done demonstrate that you are really serious about this work and that there's a real relevance of this work to that supervisor and their expertise 
And finally, make sure that in your application, you are demonstrating the impact of your project. Now, me personally, I believe that this is why there is so much funding for STEM subjects as opposed to the arts, humanities, social sciences, etc. That's because in the STEM field, sometimes it's easier to see the tangible outcome of that project. You can see that, okay, this is, um, you know, a drug or this is a finding that's going to feed into, you know, this bigger research. That is much harder to do and to measure in these other subjects. So make sure that you have taken the time to reflect and think about how this has any real world impact. And a way you can do that is thinking about the wider world. So let's step back from the PhD research itself. How does this feed into our wider understanding of the world? Is it the case that there are timely conversations happening? Is this something that politicians are talking about? Is this something that is in the news media cycle at the moment? Is this something that is, you know, kind of on the collective mind of a society or a smaller group? Why is it that you need to do this research now? Why is it almost urgent? You need to show in your application, you know, I'm the right person to do this, this is a great project, but this has to happen. And this has to happen because it has a big impact on this group of people or the world or this particular institution or context. And remember, that can come from the findings or the recommendations of your work, but it can also come from your methodologies. Is there something new and exciting that you're offering um, that, you know, could really support academia, but also public knowledge? Essentially, what you're trying to answer is apart from you gaining a PhD at the end of this all, what does this offer us? And in writing this impact piece, in writing your entire application, just really take the time to make sure everything adds up. This is essentially storytelling. You are talking about why you are the best person to do this. So again, that's your, your academic experience, your relevance, your work experience, why this needs to be done now. Think about the impact, what this project has to be has to offer. Think about the relevance to your department and to your supervisor. Why is it that you need to do this here specifically? Why can't you do this at University Y or University Z? And of course, make sure you've looked at successful applications who have done and demonstrated this well. It's very much about the person receiving your application, reading it and going, oh my goodness, this all makes sense. This all works so well together, it is very well packaged. And yes, this person is the right person to do it. This is the right supervisor for them to be supervised by. This is the right department for them to be in and this is the right time for them to do this PhD. If you can demonstrate those things, if you can do them well and create you know, as much as you can this narrative um, and perhaps a narrative of urgency of um yeah of things being the right time then hopefully 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 you will receive both an offer and funding i really hope this video has been helpful if you're interested in more postgraduate application advice or undergraduate application advice depending on who you are um there are loads more videos on my channel so do subscribe and i am uploading on a regular basis in addition to that i do create vlogs sharing my experience as a PhD student, so feel free to subscribe for that reason too. If you are applying for a PhD at the moment, please do remember that rejection isn't necessarily a sign you should never do a PhD. Sometimes it is just about timing and circumstance, and there will be more opportunities. Most people who are doing PhDs have applied quite a few times, um, and as long as you kind of get that suitability piece right, Hopefully things will work out for you. Thank you so much for watching. Best of luck with your application and see you in the next video.